Welcome to the Lessons from Lab and Life podcast, brought to you by New England Biolabs. I'm your host, Lydia Morrison, and I hope this episode will offer you some new perspective. Today, I interview Professor Jim Collins of Massachusetts Institute of Technology about how his work in synthetic biology has helped drive synbio-based diagnostics to detect SARS-CoV-2, both in the CLIA lab setting as well as in the wearable device arena. We'll talk about how synthetic biology has helped us detect and mitigate the current COVID-19 pandemic and how it can help prevent future pandemics. Hi, Jim. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me, Lydia. Yeah, I wanted to jump right in and um, have you tell us how your research uniquely positions you to join the fight against COVID-19. You know, we've been working in two broad areas where I think we were very well positioned to jump into the fight against the pandemic. One is our area and work in synthetic biology. And second is our area and growing work around using artificial intelligence for discovering uh, antimicrobials. With regards to synthetic biology, for now over two decades, we've been really looking to see to what extent can we use engineering principles in molecular biology to model, design, and build synthetic gene circuits and other molecular components, and to use these to rewire living cells and cell-free systems, endowing them with novel functions for a variety of applications. Most of our effort has been focused on developing new classes of diagnostics and therapeutics. Mm. Of relevance to the listeners, we were actually involved over a decade ago in one of the earliest demonstrations that synthetic mRNA could be used for biomedical applications. So we had teamed up with Derek Rossi and George Daly to show that you could use synthetic mRNA for reprogramming and redifferentiation of stem cells. And this paper that was in Stell Stem Cell back in 2010 actually became the paper that launched Moderna. So Derek Rossi went off and founded the company. And in the piece, we noted you could use this for therapeutics and vaccines and had no idea that this could eventually help contribute to the pandemic. But, you know, more specifically to my lab, most of our effort in synthetic biology development in the pandemic has been around diagnostics. Mm. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So it's really in two general categories under the banner of synthetic biology. One is around CRISPR-based diagnostics, Mm -hmm. and the other is broadly around wearable synthetic biology. So in the context of CRISPR diagnostics, going back now, goodness, five years ago, we demonstrated in the midst of the Zika pandemic that one could use synthetic biology in a cell-free, freeze-dried manner in the context of paper-based diagnostics. We showed you could open up a living cell and take the machinery out, or in fact, use NEB Pure, which in fact was our choice, mm-hmm. where what you have is the inner machinery of the cell, DNA, RNA, like, mm-hmm. machine, like ribosomes, molecules like ATP and nucleotides. And we showed you could freeze-dry these on paper. And sometime later, rehydrate them, reactivate them, and have them function as if they were in a test tube or in a living cell. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, and we'd use this initially to get after antibiotic resistance. This was back in 2014, but showed that you could actually extend it to viral pathogens. And in 2014, we addressed the Ebola crisis, but we're in a very strong position to create diagnostics for Zika back in 2016, leading to paper-based diagnostics that were actually deployed as part of the crisis in six different countries as both surveillance tools and research tools. And in that context, we used both synthetic biology sensors of the viral RNA, but also introduced the first use of CRISPR as a diagnostic component and specifically showed how you could use CRISPR-Cas9 to differentiate between different strains. That led to an interaction with Feng Zhang, my colleague at MIT and the Broad Institute, and of CRISPR fame, to collaborate on using not CRISPR-Cas9, but Cas13, which is an enzyme, CRISPR enzyme, that will target RNA, not DNA. And when it's brought to its targets by its guy, will not only degrade its target, but will also exhibit collateral activity and degrade other RNA structures in its environment. We use the latter to then create a highly sensitive diagnostic platform called Sherlock Mm -hmm. that was set up so that you could have quench fluorophores that were held, the fluorophore was held near the quencher by RNA linkers that would be degraded in the face of a detection. 
Feng Zhang and I showed you could use this to detect antibiotic resistance, bacterial pathogens, viral pathogens like Zika and Dengue. And we launched a company called Sherlock Biosciences now three and a half years ago to advance this platform and related synthetic biology platforms to really address challenges in molecular diagnosis, including infectious diseases and at home use. But in the midst of the pandemic, the company where I'm very active as a science advisor pivoted toward, CRISP, uh, toward COVID-19. And starting in February 2020, advanced an effort to create a CRISPR-based diagnostic test that was for CLIA lab use. And by early May, had actually the first FDA-approved CRISPR-based diagnostic test. Wow, that's amazing. And is that, was that a paper-based test as well? It was uh, elements of freeze-dried. So it was actually utilized in CLIA lab. So in mm -hmm. fact, it, it did not need to be CRISPR-based, though it, uh, sorry, it did not need to be paper-based, though it could have been. Okay. But in fact, it was based in labs. And, you know, notably, we were a strong view at the company that it wouldn't be appropriate to profit from the pandemic. And so we actually set up the 221B Foundation, named after Sherlock Holmes' fictional address in Baker Street. Oh, I love that. <laughs> where we made available uh, our CRISPR IP for any group around the world that wanted to develop a COVID diagnostic on the condition that they make their profits available to the foundation. And we as a company made all of our profits available from our CRISPR diagnostic to the foundation, which is using those profits to advance STEM efforts for underrepresented minorities. Notably, we've now teamed up with five global diagnostic companies through Sherlock and the foundation who are now on pace to run 10 million tests per month using this CRISPR-based diagnostic. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and I do I do know about the Sherlock Biosciences team because I, I did an earlier interview with um, Feng Zhang and Omar Aboudier and, ah. um, and uh, Jonathan Gutenberg. Um, so we do, I, I, our audience should definitely go listen to that podcast and get a little bit more um, background on how that technology works too because it's a, a great technology. Although I hadn't heard how quickly your team, the team had, there had been able to pivot to focus on COVID-19 diagnostics. So that's really wonderful to hear. Um, yeah. And I think it speaks to one of the key advantages of synthetic biology, one of the key advantages of the related CRISPR technology, which is its programmability. Meaning yeah. that because it's sequence focused, in this case, RNA or DNA or in the nucleic acid world, it's very easy to change up the components of the diagnostic so that you can target a new pathogen mm -hmm. and or target a new variant of the pathogen. And we advanced in the midst of the pandemic, a, a platform called Minimally Instrumented Sherlock, hmm. a work we just published a couple months ago in Science Advances that involves a very low cost 3D printed handheld device that can be used at home, costs only a few dollars, can give an output in under an hour that rivals lab-based RT-PCR. Wow. But that also is relevant to the emergence of variants and can be readily reprogrammed to detect variants. And to note how fast this pandemic can change, going back just a few months ago when we were very active on that effort, we were targeting the original UK variant, South African variant, and Brazilian variant. Mm -hmm. Had the piece go through and it was published just as the Delta variant was ravaging the world. But it speaks to how quickly one can change up these diagnostic elements. And again, going back to the mRNA vaccines, I think also their programmability is very attractive and that they too can be changed up. But unfortunately, the regulatory path has not kept pace with the programmability and that I think the booster shots that we all will get will actually be targeting the alpha variant and not the delta variant, although it would be very straightforward for those teams to reprogram the RNA vaccine. But the question is, would the FDA accept that or would you need to run new trials? That makes me wonder if there needs to be a new pathway in, in the regulatory system um, such that you approve a vaccine sort of like backbones, if you will, you know, the, you approve the, like the structure of the vaccine, but allow for some exchange of those variable regions of, of the variants that you're trying to detect. Do you think that that's like feasible? I do think it's feasible. I'm not a vaccine expert, and I'm certainly not an FDA expert. Mm -hmm. But my understanding is that the kind of system you just outlined is one that's in place for the flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. The flu vaccine, which I just got my shot at MIT yesterday, changes each year depending upon what the calculation is of the emerging variants. And I guarantee you that they're not running new clinical trials every year on the basis of whatever five or six strains that they're putting into the mix. And you would think that we could take advantage of that precedent for other 
viral pathogens and even bacterial pathogens, including in this case, SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And maybe they just haven't, maybe they just haven't made it there in terms of COVID yet. Obviously, yeah. COVID-19 hasn't been around as long as the flu has, yeah. um, but hopefully they're headed that way because certainly we need to be able to turn around new diagnostics to detect specific variants on a much quicker time scale, right, right? To be able to protect the community. So I heard that you made a, a, a face mask, you developed a face mask that can actually detect COVID. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. So this was also in the context of our work around synthetic biology. So when we uncovered that it was possible to freeze dry cell-free extracts systems along with synthetic biology constructs onto paper, we also uncovered that this wasn't limited to paper, that it could also be extended to other porous substrates, including clothing or textiles. Hmm. And going back now two, three years ago, we we're advancing efforts and showed that you could use over a hundred different fabrics that could wick up a cell-free system along with a body contract, be freeze-dried and be programmed to be a wearable diagnostic. And we were advancing efforts of detecting viral and bacterial pathogens, as well as physiological and environmental small molecules, in addition to nerve agents and various toxins mm. in a wearable diagnostic form that could be used by healthcare workers, first responders, military personnel. We're advancing things such as the lab code of the future, the idea that, that healthcare personnel could have patches or a wearable set of components into their lab code as they make rounds around the hospital to indicate have they been exposed to a pathogen and or is there an outbreak mm. of note in the hospital and tracing it back to sources. Like Sherlock Biosciences, when the pandemic hit, our team at the Beeson Institute at MIT pivoted and thought, okay, as we're actually revising a paper for Nature Biotech, which has since recently come out, how could we best utilize this platform to get after the pandemic? And we had the idea that we would create a wearable face mask diagnostic. And the idea was quite simple. Could we create a paper-based, in this case, and or cloth-based insert that could be added to any face mask? And the notion would be you'd wear this. And the normal act of talking, breathing, coughing, sneezing would give off water vapor that if you were infected, would contain the viral particles. And we developed then a very simple foldable lateral flow assay component that could be at any face mask that had a collection zone, a lysosome, an amplification zone, detection zone, an output zone, programmed it with CRISPR sensors to go after various elements of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 and demonstrated a highly sensitive, highly specific wearable face mask diagnostic that could give you a readout in anywhere from 10 minutes to 30 minutes down to about 500 viral particles. And we wouldn't view it as a diagnostic test, but really more as a surveillance test. So if mm -hmm. you're suspecting that or wondering, boy, my flu or my cold-like symptoms, is it COVID or is it just a cough or possibly the flu flu being there? I wonder that on a weekly basis. I'm sure there are, there are millions of people around the country that, yeah. that are wondering that. And boy, if you could just put it in your face mask as you go on shopping, the insert, and then come home and get some comfort or indicate, okay, this is a, you know, it turns green. Yeah. How long would you have to wear the face mask? So our, our estimate is anywhere from 10 minutes to say an hour, depending okay. upon how much do you talk, how much do you breathe, how much do you call, uh, call right. um, back and forth. But it, you know, on a relatively small amount of time, and given that we have mask mandates or uh, mask advisories still in significant portions of the country, as we should with Delta going back, I think it could be a nice way to help better contain spread in that it's not easy to get to a site to get a test. Frankly, the at-home tests aren't as good as they should be and not as easy to use. But if you could just add this in, go about your business as you get to work or to school or go shopping uh, or just out for a walk, boy, it'd be nice to get a readout to then say, Ooh, you know, maybe I now need to go and confirm or I'm just going to play it safe. I'm going to self-isolate for five or 10 days. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think there would be a, a big demand for something like that. Certainly, I know the adoption of the home tests has been you know, really strong. I know we have some in our cabinet for when, you know, someone's like feeling questionable when someone's yeah. throat starts to tickle or nose starts to run or something like that. So it's really nice to have that assurance. And I could definitely see how um, a predictive mask insert could be really helpful and sort of be part of like the everyday. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, as a surveillance tool, similar to these at home tests, I think, again, yeah. they're good to give some additional information or insight and then one makes the decision either take it, isolate, or get a conf confirmatory PCR antigen test at a CVS minute clinic. Absolutely. What role do you see synthetic biology playing in decreasing the threat of future pandemics? I think synthetic biology is going to play a major role 
really on two counts to start. One is in the diagnostics. I think that synthetic biology with its programmable nature will be a big part of the sensor component and the device implementation component of future diagnostics, where in a matter of hours or days, we can have systems put in place. There still is a lot of work outside of the synthetic biology on device implementation, sample prep, ease of use that has, I think, caught people's attention in the midst of the pandemic. The second is around vaccines. I think synthetic biology underlies at least the game-changing synthetic mRNA vaccines, and I think those will be quite important moving forward. I think we got lucky with the very clear targets in SARS-CoV-2, specifically the spike protein. I don't think it's as clear for many other pathogens of what you would target, and so there'll be additional work. The area that I think has come up short in our response has been therapeutics. And as I mentioned earlier, our efforts around artificial intelligence, I think that there were a lot of well-meaning efforts, including some in our lab, on trying to get after therapeutics. They were all focusing on repurposing to get around the challenges of getting clearance, regulatory approval. And I think they were wrong-headed in two counts. One is that I think we really need, in most cases, novel chemicals, mm -hmm. these novel molecules to go after a pathogen. Second, it's likely we need combinations. And most antivirals that have been the most successful have many have involved combination therapies. And I think deep learning approaches, artificial intelligence approaches will increase our capacity. So outside of synthetic biology, but still around biological engineering and harnessing these advanced technological efforts are going to significantly enhance our ability to discover and or design novel molecules to stop a pathogen, including viral pathogens, and to design combinations of either existing molecules or novel chemical entities to stop a pathogen. The challenge broadly in combinations is that they very quickly can explode combinatorially in terms of the number of tests you would need to run experiments. Those tests still can be quite challenging if you're going to even run it in silico on a computer, but if you have a computer model to be your base model around deep learning that was trained on actual data, it's our hope that with the right experiments to collect the key types of data, you could develop much more efficient screening methods to get after more effective combinations. Yeah, I think that's that's really exciting to hear. I, I feel like we're just starting to hear about therapeutics and sort of the mainstream news yes. um, for COVID. Certainly, there's been research going on, I'm sure, throughout the pandemic um, to try to find those therapeutics. Um, but I really haven't heard... I really haven't heard much talk about it from scientists directly. So I think that that's really exciting to hear that there's a lot of ways that synthetic biology could help power the identification of those novel compounds. Yeah, you know, I, I, so a few points to that one is I do think synthetic biology's role will likely be in helping to create efficient screening assays mm. that could have meaningful outputs for new emerging pathogens, coupling those then with the artificial intelligence type computational problems. On you know, recent therapeutic developments, Merck just came out with a small molecule that appears to be promising. There's another small biotech that just also announced a small molecule. So we're seeing now this you know, 20 months into the pandemic, some now promise. Earlier, you saw repurposing of various molecules like remdesivir and biologics, right. including antibodies. And the antibodies have been quite promising, though difficult to produce. So again, I think the therapeutics has come up short, but now we're starting to catch up. And I think it's will likely point to valuable lessons of how we can be in a much better position for the next pandemic. And unfortunately, you know, the next pandemic is coming. We don't know when, we don't know from where, but it's coming. And hopefully we don't grow complacent as we now come out of the current one and learn as much as we can to be in such a much better, stronger position for the next one. What's the coolest thing that you're working on right now? Like what's the project in your lab that you're most excited about? Well, we have many, and like a parent, I'm careful not to use superlatives with my kids or my projects, but I'll, I'll present a cool project. All right, I'll accept so that. A cool project. We've become really excited about RNA therapeutics. I think in part from the success of Moderna, in part from now efforts uh, that are coming out of flagship pioneering, where we work quite a bit with, and others, are really excited about what RNA holds as promise. And we think that synthetic biology offers tremendous possibilities for control. So can we better control how that RNA is expressed through interaction with other nucleic acids or with small molecules? We have a new paper coming out in Nature Biotech where we actually showed you could engineer mRNA elements to function in human cells that are kept in a tight off state that then could be flipped on in the presence of specific RNA molecules. 
that might be in a cell-specific, tissue-specific standpoint and or from an infection standpoint or an endogenous trigger standpoint. Wow. We're very excited about what that opens up from both a, kind of an mRNA therapeutic standpoint, a la Moderna, and or an mRNA control standpoint from a gene and cell therapy standpoint. We now are advancing efforts to see to what extent can we engineer mRNAs to similarly be in a tight offset that can be flipped on with various small molecules. And this, again, would open up great control possibilities. And we have some really nice early advances in that count and are now also seeing to what extent we could harness AI in the synthetic biology context to better infer design principles so that we could design from the bottom up specific control elements for a target small molecule. Interesting. I mean, that sounds like an incredibly powerful tool to sort of have the ability to to turn those triggers on and off once they're already present in the system. Can you give me some examples of the applications of that kind of therapy? Yeah. So the ones that would respond to specific RNA molecules, you could envision in this case that it would be tissue specific, that you'd only have the RNA therapeutic turn on in a particular tumor cell. Mm-hmm. or in a particular cell type that might be a muscle or a neuronal cell. In terms of the small molecule, you can envision, small molecule control, you can envision now having this where you could widely deliver your mRNA therapeutic. And in this case, now turn it on temporally and or spatially with the small molecule and or dose, use the small molecule to dose the response. One of the challenges at present is that without control, how do you control for dose levels? So the Moderna sure. vaccine was very, very high dose on expression. So you, your dose, the expression level was very high compared to Pfizer. That ended up giving a much stronger immune response, but you can envision now on a therapeutic that you might be needing every day uh, for weeks, months, if not many years, you'd want to make sure that you could tune it so that you get within the right therapeutic window, both for efficacy, safety, tolerability, and having a small molecule and or a nucleic acid control element could really change significantly the clinical applicability of these systems. That's really interesting. How far away do you feel like those therapeutics are from being, you know, publicly available or, or let's say, or let's say being able to being ready to sort of submit to regulatory bodies? You know, I don't think it's far off. So we, you know, we, I, I primarily function in my academic lab at MIT and mm-hmm. the BC student and the Burden student there. We're getting after early proof of concept demonstrations and, cell lines and animal models, not humans. Mm-hmm. And so then it's taking the most promising ones, likely moving them into startups. And you know, we are excited on this RNA therapeutic space of startup possibilities. There you want to advance to non-human primates, demonstrate, and then move into humans. But given the extreme and growing interest in RNA therapeutics, again, speaking to Moderna's great success in this case in the COVID vaccines, but they have many therapeutic programs. We are really excited about the possibility. So I, I don't think it's far off relative to other advances, but it's certainly not something that's going to happen next week. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, we'll all stay tuned and be excited to see the progress of those therapeutics and um, look forward to science helping everybody live longer, happier, healthier lives. Yeah, I as well. I do think that synthetic biology and artificial intelligence separately and together are going to be amongst the defining technologies of the century. And I think each are incredibly well positioned to dramatically advance our ability to address challenges in human health. I absolutely agree. Thanks so much for joining me today, Jim. Thanks for having me, ladies. Good talking with you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Lessons from Lab and Life podcast. Catch our next episode when we interview Dr. Neville Sanjana, a core faculty member at the New York Genome Center, about his recent publication entitled Chemically Modified Guide RNAs Enhance CRISPR-Cas13 Knockdown in Human Cells. Hope you'll join us for some new perspective.